In this week's episode of Shogun, we move from the idea of fate to loyalty. Blackthorn sounds like he's a week behind when he tells Yabashige he knows he's a man who understands the importance of taking fate into his own hands. But since he's a foreigner, I guess we can overlook his mistake. And where some of the adaptation choices last week had me scratching my head, this week was such a great hour of TV that it's no longer a concern. But there is so much that makes me confident in how this show is unfolding that apprehension has given way to genuine excitement. I can't wait to see how they wrap this up. Many of these changes are about adaptation, but some may actually improve the story, which I know might be sacrilege depending on your experience with the book. But I would say at this point, even if you don't like how they land this plane, it should be evident that they know how to make gripping TV and have a plan on where they're going. I'd be really surprised if they crashed into the side of the mountain. Because I'm going to spend most of this video gushing, I'll just throw my main nitpick out before we get started. It is moving very quickly and probably would have benefited from a few more episodes to dive a little deeper into motivations. But that said, it's all there and I tend to think that leaving you not sure of the meaning of some of what happens turns out to be a feature rather than a bug. And I'll say, you know it's a good episode when you barely notice Fuji didn't make an appearance. But man, the rest of her family, this was not a good episode for them. It was her grandfather Hiromatsu's last, and given what a gut punch that was, it makes sense to start there. But not in the actual scene, because the seeds were planted much earlier in the episode when Mariko is called to a meeting between Toronaga and Alvido. Toronaga cuts off direct communication with the Jesuit because the church was unsuccessful in bringing the Catholic regents over to his side. As Mariko translates, he suggests that they try to form an alliance with Ochiba. And when Toronaga asks Hiramatsu what he thinks, that leads to him calling his lord out, saying his face has the color of defeat, and he doesn't recognize it. Toronaga assures his oldest friend that this victory would come at too high of a cost, so he chooses a peaceful defeat. That's his story and he's sticking with it. And while we know it's a ruse, there is a price to be paid for sure. Because he keeps his promise of letting them build a church in Edo, as long as Alvido returns to Osaka to let everyone know he won't fight back, Hiramatsu comes out of the meeting convinced it's a ploy. He tells the inner circle that Toronaga will fight. Blackthorn is out of the loop, so he arranges a meeting with Yabu to try to convince him to form an alliance to try to at least do something. He doesn't even know what that is, but he can't wrap his head around the idea of just sitting back and waiting while the other side slips their nooses around their necks. His desperation comes after his long-anticipated reunion with his crew, or as it turns out, just one of them. He gets himself all pumped up to go pay them a visit in the shady part of town they've been settled in, and immediately something smells amiss. And it's literal. Their actual smell sets off red flags. And much to his surprise, Salomon blames him for getting them stuck there in the first place. There's some truth in what he's saying. And by throwing the first blow, he spares the engine from having to confront that. They fight, and after Blackthorn unloads on him, he storms away without seeing the rest of the crew. This is one of the changes from the book I really liked. In that, he hangs around with his men who are all mostly happy to see him and ready to get back on the ship. In that version, Blackthorn starts to be put off by them and eventually realizes that being in Japan for so long is rubbed off on him, and he's no longer at home amongst his fellow Europeans. In this version, it forces him to look inward, and that seems more true to life. I think realizing you don't fit either place and thinking about why that is, or just running away from it, that's more interesting. So this sends him to the only man he thinks he understands in Japan. Maybe based on his outbursts at the end of the last episode, there were two, but the other one died a death that ranks lower than boiling and higher than being eaten by a dog. In the scene with Yabu, he brings up the connection they've had since the day on the cliff. And this kind of work, at least until Yabu glances over at Omi and realizes what's important. And at this point, he still believes what Hiramatsu said about Toronaga fighting. So he denies Blackthorn's request to sail under his banner. And that opens the door for Mariko to deliver her thoughts on loyalty. She points out that once it begins, it does not have an end. And when Blackthorn counters that it turns into something else when suicide enters the picture, it backs up his idea that he'll never truly belong there. Like most of these scenes, the acting fills in a lot of the blanks. And so it really cuts when she asks if he wants her to translate that last bit or if it was just for her. 
What's fascinating about his situation is that when they're approaching Edo in the beginning, it seems like he'll have to make a choice. He's been given back the rudder in his journal and been released from his duty to Toronaga. Then he asks Mariko what she'll do and tries to talk her out of going to Osaka, but this isn't something she would ever consider. So you think he'll have to decide whether he wants to team up with his crew and leave or stay because of the feelings he's developed. By the time his pitch to Yabashige fails, neither of those options feel like they're on the table anymore. And really quickly before we move on, this is our first time visiting Edo and all of the construction leaves a great impression. In case you didn't know, Edo will become Tokyo and seeing it like this made me wonder about its history. In the official podcast, they talk about how there was always a castle there, but it was mostly just a small village by the time Toronaga's historical counterpart decided to build it up. What a great time in the story to get a sense of his vision of the future in the process of being made real, while at the same time he's guarding his plans on how that might happen, given the current circumstances. Omi steps up into the role of being the one to outwardly struggle with the way those are playing out. There's a great character showcase early in the episode where the inner circle of samurai gather to mourn Nagakado. They joke around and Hiramatsu even gets a little harsh about his recklessness. When Omi speaks up, he expresses his surprise that Toronaga isn't there and says that for all his faults, Nagakado was loyal. He couldn't sit by and watch his father cut open his stomach in front of Ishido, so he sacrificed his life to try to change that. Later, he'll carry the thread of loyalty to a conversation with Kiku, while Gin is being shown the plot of land Toronaga has set aside for her to build her new tea house district. When Omi suggests that it was her work that earned this for Gin, Kiku is quick to express the pride she takes in serving her mistress. Then he says the thing that everyone around Toronaga has been wondering. Can loyalty ever be a disservice or even a harm? This is something she doesn't even need to think about. The answer is just no. And when Omi admits he doesn't even know what he's fighting for anymore, she delivers a really great answer. If you look and see nothing, you must simply look harder. And because it doesn't really fit anywhere else, I'll say it's nice, but also interesting to see that Gin's conversation with Toronaga made that much of an impression. We saw that he was giving her this at the end of the last episode, so it's great to see him follow through there, but also to see that the site of the church happens to be in the connecting plot. So Alvito's reaction to learning that he's next to a tea house full of courtesans was pretty funny as well. What wasn't funny was the day Buntaro had leading up to this big meeting with Toronaga that I promise I'm getting to. While Mariko is meeting with Lady Rin to see Toronaga's new granddaughter, which is another thing I'll come back to, Buntaro says he'd like to prepare tea for his wife. While he's done a lot to make himself an unlikable character, especially the abuse of that same wife, this scene reveals a different side. The tea ceremony is something I've read about and seen depicted in movies and television, but never experienced firsthand. Seeing how they show it here, I went down the first of several rabbit holes related to this episode. After reading about it, I'll say that it's a very particular ritual, and from what I can tell, they did a great job of recreating it exactly how it should be. Everything you see on screen is the same things I read about. The way we see Mariko enter, the sparse decoration, and the way she's there by herself to observe and take in every detail before they share the cha. The most interesting thing I came across related to this scene is that one of the most famous tea masters worked for the Taiko, and the real-life person Buntaro is inspired by was one of his most devoted students. You can read more about that and the ceremony on FX's website, and they also discuss that in another rabbit hole I went down, which is the poetry throughout this episode. You can hear more about both of those things on the official podcast. For all his skills related to serving tea, this ceremony doesn't go the way that Buntara hoped it would. There's a moment where it seems like they might work things out, even after he says they were happy in the early days and she doesn't seem to remember it that way. I might be thinking that because it does end differently in the book. They sort of patch things up briefly, but they do end up in the same place eventually. Again, this works because of the acting involved, because you see these characters experiencing so many different emotions. What's tragic about this isn't just the rejection he gets from his wife here, and you can't feel too bad for him in that because of the abuse I've already mentioned. But the part that makes it matter when he cries by himself after she leaves is the realization of how wrong he was about the entire situation. 
You don't have to like the character. You just have to be human to understand that. He really thinks he's finally giving Mariko what she wants when he suggests they die together. And that's why her response seems to carry the exact amount of cruelty necessary to get the point across. What you denied me wasn't death. It was a life beyond your reach. And I would sooner live a thousand years than die with you like this. So that's what he's walking into this room with. And that's pretty much everyone except the man himself. Tornaga has spent the entire episode committed to the bit. He's been coughing and looking sick even when no one else is around. He missed the dinner in Nagakado's honor and skipped his funeral. At every chance, he's projected the idea that he's given up and has reserved himself to a peaceful death. He's had word that his generals wore their armor to his son's funeral in protest. So now he's called all his vassals together to sign a pledge to join him in surrender. He also announces he'll send Yabu to Osaka to deliver his guns to Ishido. Omi and Yabashige both sign the pledge, but when it gets to those generals, the ones he already knows are protesting, they refuse to sign. They want to fight and urge their lord to just stay in place so Ishida will have to come to them and even though they'll probably lose, at least they'll go down fighting. This makes sense and is the same thing that Hiramatsu was trying to say earlier. They've all followed him and have been willing to give their lives, but to just give up? That would undermine everything they worked for and make the sacrifices feel like they're for nothing. Toronaga says that fighting Ishido in Edo will destroy the city, and he's not wrong in that either. The show emphasized this vision of the future, and there are a lot of people on hand to make that happen, so their plan would involve a lot of misery as well. When he realizes neither side will back down, and Hiramatsu watches one of the generals put his hand on his sword, he makes a declaration. If Toronaga won't change his mind, he'll commit seppuku at once. The generals were trying to call his bluff, essentially. They thought they could get him to change his mind and at least go out like a man that they'd want to follow. Hiramatsu understands that if he does that, he locks himself into exactly what they described. In the current state of affairs, Nagakato's death has bought him some time. And if Ishido thinks he really intends to surrender, then he can plot behind the scenes. After taking that all in, he decides to sacrifice himself. And it's somewhat open to interpretation as to why he thinks his sacrifice is necessary. I mean, at the end, of the day they're all dead men walking in almost every potential outcome is it that big of a deal if three of his men commit seppuku ahead of time i didn't necessarily have an answer for that but what i liked about this scene was when you track both actors and you see what they're doing you understand the history that they have together and you see that hiramatsu understands the situation and he's the only person that can step up to do this because of that history it's such a shock that Toronaga doesn't waver and watches his old friend and closest advisor slit open his belly in front of him that it's a little hard to accept. I went through a couple of different explanations in my head before I reached the one Toronaga all but confirmed later with Mariko. My first reaction was simply, damn, Toronaga is a monster. Just 100% cold-blooded. And then I thought there must have been a plan in place that only they knew about going into the meeting that we're just watching play out. Out. Like Toronaga and Hiramatsu must have talked to each other and planned this to go this way. I don't think either one of those things is true after thinking about it, at least not completely in regards to Toronaga being a monster. As far as it being a plan, when you go back and watch again, it seems pretty clear that it's developing in real time. The looks they pass and the way things unfold seem to shock Toronaga as much as anyone. It only works if he knows that Hiramatsu knows what he's setting in motion and has decided to do it anyway. That he's choosing to do it because it's an opportunity for him to ensure the best outcome. And I think you can see them come to that realization as it's happening. I think you can also see that Toronaga wishes that it hadn't come to this, but I suppose that's up for debate. Another thing I struggled with was why Hiro is so certain that this will get the other generals to back down. For one thing, this will prove they can't sway him, so that's just as effective for them as it will be for Ishido. Also, if you think it through, there isn't much they can do and still maintain their honor. They could kill Toronaga like Mariko's father killed his lord, but look at how that ended for him. Threatening and going through with seppuku now instead of when they reach Osaka was the only real card they had to play, and Hiramatsu stole it from them. His final words to Bintaro are also a message, if not an explanation for his actions. He tells him not to give up on their lord, even when it appears he has given up on himself. 
And it's really more of a personal message to Buntaru when he refuses to let him follow him into death, but telling him he'll know what it is to be denied in the same way he denied Mariko all those years is just another thing that Buntaro has had to deal with on this terrible day. Plus he got this dropped on him right before he had to chop his father's head off. So it's a day he won't forget anytime soon. It's a tragic situation for everyone involved. Tornaga could have stopped it, but in his mind that would have made things much worse. I mentioned that I didn't come away thinking of him as a monster, and that was a little surprising. Putting things together, what happened seemed to back that up, but my feeling at the end of the episode was that it was complicated rather than calculated. I think the key thing is that Toronaga believes he's doing this for a greater cause. He genuinely believes that his vision of the future will improve Japan, and that it's worth the sacrifice. Power is part of his motivation, but it's not the only thing, and their relationship with death is just different. The jury is still out. Things may change. This is a powerful person who looks at men as falcons that can be broken to the fist. He said as much out loud to his son. I'm not making the point that he's noble or even that he's the right kind of leader. I'm just saying the show is telling me it's complicated and that he believes his decisions will make things better. He also reveals his hidden heart to Mariko in the scene they share later. After a poetry exchange where he concedes that she's better at it than him, he asks if Blackthorn has gone to Yabashige yet. This surprises her, but it's an even bigger surprise when after she says he refused, he says that Yabu will change his mind after today. Hiromatsu made sure of it. Then he calls them goshawks, which is another rabbit hole I had to go down. Turns out you don't need to because what he said pretty much sums it up. He knew how they would react. The acting here where he calls Hiramatsu his old friend who knew his duty well seems to confirm what I was saying before. And he ends their conversation saying that Osaka has to believe his defeat is real and asking Mariko if she's ready to do her part. She is. This isn't even all that happens though. In Osaka, we see Ishido get word of Toronaga's surrender, and to celebrate, he floats the idea of marriage to Ochiba. She doesn't say no, but the look on her face doesn't make you think she might say yes either. He leaves it as an open offer, and she contemplates whether she wants to give up any of the power that she's put together. These actions make sense for both of them. Of course, he wants the status and the power that comes along with the air, and she doesn't want to give any of that up. In the end, it doesn't matter because the Taiko's other wife suffers a stroke and eventually dies. Before she does that, she leaves Ochiba with one final wish. Free the hostages and ditch Ashido. She says he came from nothing and is nothing. And while Ochiba has reasons to hate her, in these final interactions she appears to have an affection for her at the same time. I half expected her to follow her advice, but after the funeral we see her go and bow to Ashido, which I thought the look on his face said that this was her accepting his marriage proposal, but wasn't 100% sure, but that is confirmed on the show's site. This is an interesting development, but I think it goes back to what Mariko was saying saying to Ochiba's sister when she met with her at the beginning of the episode. She fears Toranaga even when everything says he's given up, and she can stay hidden if she relents some of her power to Ishido while still being the one to pull the strings. And while this was a heavy episode and actually taxing emotionally thanks to Hiramatsu, there is some good news. The team up we've all been waiting for is on. And I loved how Yabu tries to tell Blackthorn that what he said meant a lot to him, basically confirming their bros, only for the engine not to understand what he was trying to say. It does come through that they're allies now, and then Mariko arrives to let them know that Toronaga has ordered her to accompany them to Osaka. And from there it's on. Hopefully whenever they swing by Ajiro to get the ship, they also pick up Fuji. The episode closes with a coughing Toranaga pulling himself out of bed to visit Nagakato's ashes. He thanks his son for earning him some time and promises he won't waste it. He acknowledges Hiramatsu's sacrifice as well, repeats that he won't waste it, and then it cuts to black. I really can't wait to see what happens next. There is a lot to think about. The parallels between Hiramatsu and Toranaga, Ishido and Ochiba, and Yabu and Blackthorn, what they offer to each other and how that sets things up for the ending. Mariko and Ochiba's relationship opens up some possibilities for an ending that would play out pretty similarly to the book without being exactly the same. I won't speculate here, but will say that I think there is a lot of potential, and I think that's a great place to leave things. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.